Hello, I'm Callan Overhull, your host for the MIT course on COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, and the pandemic. Together with Drs. Richard Young and Facundo Batista, we have organized this MIT course on COVID-19. On behalf of the three of us, thank you for joining us today. The purpose of this course is to learn what we know about this virus and the pandemic from top class scientists in different areas uh, relevant to this new coronavirus. And who better to teach us about this pandemic than our distinguished speaker today? I have the great honor of introducing Dr. Rochelle P. Wilensky. Dr. Wilensky is the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Something that distinguishes Dr. Wilensky is her sense of duty to the community. She demonstrated this when as professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and chief of the Division for Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital. She served on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic and conducted research on vaccine delivery strategies to reach underserved communities. She is an influential scholar whose pioneering research has helped to advance the national and global response to HIV and AIDS. Dr. Walensky is recognized internationally for her work to improve HIV screening and care in South Africa, and nationally recognized for motivating health policy and informing clinical trial design and evaluation in a variety of settings. She is a past chair of the Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council at the National Institutes of Health, chair-elect of the HIV Medical Association, and previously served as an advisor to both the World Health Organization and the Joint United Nations Program on HIV and AIDS. Dr. Walensky received her Bachelor of Arts from Washington University in St. Louis, her Doctor of Medicine from the Johns Hopkins University of Medicine, and her Master's in Public Health from the Harvard, Public, from the Harvard School of Public Health. Today, Dr. Walensky will be lecturing on public health at work. Dr. Walensky says she knew she wanted to be a physician when she was young, but didn't learn much about public health until after medical school. During residency training in the early days of HIV, AIDS was a mysterious disease where medicine had few answers and little in the way of treatment. Her desire to heal her patient's suffering, but without the tools to do so, and the disparity in the way the disease was affecting communities of color in our country was the genesis of her decision to choose a career in medicine, infectious disease, and public health. She says she realized that in public health, she could reach an entire population, reach an entire population at a time with science and well-informed scientific policy. Dr. Walensky, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Kaylin, and to all of you for this invitation to join you. Um, I'm guessing each of you remembers the moment that COVID-19 first touched your life. For me, it was about 10 a.m. It was a Friday. It was a beautiful Friday morning, March 6th, um, 2020. And um, at the time, I was chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Mass General Hospital. I was in a meeting, um, and my pager went off. And that was the page that alerted me that we had the first COVID-19 case, or rather cases, in Massachusetts related to the Biogen outbreak. Um, as you probably all recall, after that first time that COVID touched your life, everything changed. Um, I'm certain at the time I had no idea I would be asked to be the 19th director of the CDC in the midst of the largest public health crisis of our lifetime. But what I'd like to do over the next um, hour or so is take you through some of the data that I now look at daily, some of the science that I now um, examine, and some of the chances, choices that we make um, here at the CDC as we uh, grapple with the challenges ahead in COVID-19. Um, so let's start first with the state of this, the pandemic, and these are data that I literally look at um, twice a day. I get an, an email briefing every evening as to the number of COVID-19 cases that we have. You can see our, our current surge. These are domestic data um, going on right now and numbers starting to come down, although at a decline that's less steep than declines we've seen before. Um, these are data from October 1st, our 118,000 uh, uh, cases reported, a uh, current seven day average of 103,000 cases. Just to be clear, um, I've intentionally not included today's. Tuesdays are a notoriously tough day because we don't get reporting from, um, from the weekend. So um, it is a couple of days out of date, but it's intentional um, because of the low reporting that we generally see on Tuesdays. 
We also look at daily change in COVID-19 hospitalizations. Um, here again, new admissions at about 6,400 and our seven-day average at about 7,600. And then, of course, our seven-day change, which we've been watching carefully, too, is minus about 17%. And then, of course, our daily change in deaths. Um, around 2,000 deaths reported on October 1, about 1,500 deaths per day. Deaths being a lagging indicator, we've always expected that deaths would decline um, after we see a decrease in, in case rates. Um, but as you can also see, deaths are declining with a less steep slope than they had in our previous surges. So we're watching this carefully. I also look at community transmission risk. So things in red are greater than 100 cases per 100,000 over a seven day period. Um, this is as of the end of last month, we watch this very carefully. Um, we can do it at a county level with over 3000 counties in the United States. We can do it at a state level. At the state level, as of right now, we only have two states that are anything but red. That's California and Connecticut. Um, and these are the benchmarks that we often use for schools or for, our, um, for, for many of our our um, guidelines as to how is your community doing. Um, if you see on this graph on the right, you can see um, how many, the fraction of states that were in each of these colors over time um, from August of 2020 to now, um, now late September, early October, you see this winter surge happened um, in the middle of uh, December there. And you can see that the majority of our counties um, are, continue to be in the high transmission area. Um, it's also the case that this map doesn't entirely tell it all because um, high is over 100 per 100,000. We have counties that are over 500 per, per 100,000, over 700 per 100,000. So it's going to take some time for this map to turn from red to orange and then from orange to yellow. Um, Let's talk for a minute about vaccines, which I think are really sort of where everybody is talking at this moment in time. And how did we come from those public health data and, and the data of where we are with transmissions and disease to having a vaccine right now? Um, until now, we have had science that has dictated when we've had vaccines, and that, that science has taken us 10 to 15 years to develop um, a vaccine. From in the normal timeline, we have research, we have preclinical trials, we have clinical trials that operate from phase one to phase two to phase three, followed by an FDA review, followed by manufacturing and distribution, and then, of course, continuous monitoring. Um, and in truly scientific, extraordinary fashion, we have been able during this pandemic to develop a vaccine in 10 to 12 months and to distribute it. And the reason for that has um, largely been twofold. One, we have had the capacity to stand on the shoulders of decades of research that happened prior to this moment. Um, and, and so we, we have to acknowledge that because these vaccines, the science was not rushed. It was that we stood on the trial, uh, on, the, on the shoulders of, of extraordinary science um, that was ongoing. And second, because um, these, many of these clinical trial phases were done um, uh, layered. So that phase one and phase two, phase two and phase three were not done sequentially. They were somewhat done in parallel. The manufacturing occurred at risk um, in the hope and the promise that the, the trials would, would demonstrate um, efficacy and that we would have these vaccines ready to go when we had the FDA review. And in fact, that did happen. The FDA review was done on a really tight timeline without cutting any corners. Distribution happened really quickly and we are continuing even now to monitor, um, of course. So, so the pandemic has allowed us to crunch what is normally a 10 to 15 year timeline for a vaccine into 10 to 12 months, which I think will be demonstrated as an extraordinary um, event um, when history tells the story of this pandemic. We, of course, now have three vaccines. Um, the first published in December of 2020, the second soon on, on its heels, and then um, the J&J vaccine published in, in April. Um, these vaccines have demonstrated the safety and efficacy of, um, at first, the Pfizer vaccine, 95% effective against symptomatic disease, followed by the Moderna vaccine, 94.1% effective against symptomatic disease, and then the J&J &J vaccine demonstrating 66% 0.1% effective against moderate, moderate to severe disease. So we at CDC take these um, vaccine 
uh, efficacy trials, and then our job is to implement and to get vaccines into arms. Um, we have in in extraordinary fashion vaccinated in this country over 185 million people and most of those people have been of course vaccinated twice with the mrna vaccines we've administered nearly 400 million doses to date in this country nearly 6 billion um, internationally um, and we watch very carefully our most recent day of doses administered our seven day average of doses administered our week on week change how are we doing um, week on week, as well as importantly, because this still remains a, remains a critical metric, how many people we are vaccinating with their first dose um, every single day. So we are at around 300,000, um, which we're vaccinating with their first dose um, every single day. So these newly vaccinated people are critically important to stopping the pandemic. Um, if you look at how many people are fully vaccinated in this country, it's about 56%, nearly 56%. How many people are fully vaccinated who are over the age of 18? About 67%. And critically important for severe diseases, how many people are fully vaccinated over the age of 65? And that is at 83.5%. We also know that vaccine uh, vaccination is heterogeneous across the country. And this, of course, is um, demonstrated in this graph where you can look at the percent of the population that's fully vaccinated. And I, many people look at the how many people have gotten a first dose. I also think that that's important, but especially in an era of Delta, in order to get real protection, we need both doses given. So the thing that's disturbing about this graph, is, uh, the map is the demonstration of the heterogeneity. And of course, you can can, you can easily see where areas that have less vaccination happening may likely be and have turned out to be areas that end up with the most disease and the highest surges when they occur. On the right, you can see the population um, that's 12 and up with at least one dose um, in, the, in the lighter greens and then that are fully vaccinated in the darker greens. And you can see that if you really are looking at the 70% benchmark, we have just over half of our states that have reached 70% with at least one dose. So still quite a bit of work to do. Um, so how do we take those vaccines and turn that into um, safety monitoring? And I would say in this moment in time, we have never followed vaccine safety to the degree that we have been able to follow it now. So as part of this um, pandemic, the vaccines that are being administered have the most intense vaccine safety monitoring in US history. We've always had extraordinary safety monitoring, but there have been a few um, tweaks that I think have really allowed um, a new, more comprehensive approach. So the first is vSafe or um, and this is and, and then I'll go through them all, but there's vSafe, there's VAERS, that's um, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, that's a passive system, Vaccine Safety Data Link and the um, the clinical immunization safety um, assessment. So these latter two are academic collaborations where we get really good information about clinical events um, and numerators as well as denominators of people who are vaccinated in and again distributed across the country. I want to spend a little bit of time talking with you about vSafe. This was really new as part of the vaccine rollout for COVID. vSafe is a smartphone based active um, safety um, monitoring system and I, I highlight that it is active. We we push out to you and ask you to respond to questions related to how you feel after your vaccine. Also, some other demographic questions. And because of this is an active push, we don't have to rely solely on um, passive reporting. So we have vSafe, which is active push. Um, we have vaccine uh, adverse event uh, reporting system. This is a passive reporting system. And then we have the two academic um, collaborations with um, VSD and CISA. Um, so the collaboration of all of these systems can give us, none is perfect, um, each have their sort of biases in terms of how we collect data, um, but they collectively can give us a comprehensive look of what's going on in vaccine safety. And the system worked. So this was um, April 23rd, we had just rolled out about six million doses of the J&J &J vaccine. Um, and at the time there were COVID-19 events, there were um, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis events after COVID-19. We had heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, 
cerebral venous thymus thrombosis events after vaccine, and then this CVST plus thrombocytopenia or um, thrombos thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome or TTS. And the real question was, as we were looking at all of this, was the J&J, the adenovirus vaccine related to this event, the CVST with thrombocytopenia? Um, we were able to, we passively received six cases. We were able to put out um, a, a health alert to be alerted to further cases, to be alerted that, to the fact that heparin should not be given in these cases. And then we um, conducted a risk benefit analysis. We had seen more cases in women, more cases in young women. And the real question was, um, what is the risk benefit of getting vaccinated with this vaccine given these rare events that we were seeing? Again, we, did, we were able to detect about six and six million um, with this vaccine for the people who are at highest risk. Um, this was an analysis done by uh, by our vaccine safety team. Um, it, was, it was publicly presented at, um, at our advisory committee on immunization practices and what was really termed the gold standard for how we look at risks and benefits. So for every 1 million doses of the vaccine given with at the current exposure, US exposure risk, um, given a J&J &J vaccine, 657 hospitalizations would be prevented, 127 ICU visits would be prevented, 12 deaths would be prevented for 13 cases of TTS for women between the ages of 18 and 49. Um, similar assessment was done for women above the age of 50. Um, things looked even more in favor of the J&J &J vaccine. And it was with these data that the J&J &J vaccine continued to be given with this um, warning on the label. Um, fast forward to um, uh, the system working again with regard to myocarditis. Of course, there were several um, there were several reports from other countries, several anecdotal reports. Were the mRNA vaccines related to myocarditis? And this was just a few months later in June 23rd. Uh, uh, several months later. And we were able with all of the data that we had from the academic collaborations through Vaccine Safety Data Link and um, uh, CISA, um, as well as the um, vSAFE reporting and the VAERS reporting to look at myocarditis reporting rates through June 11th, 2020. Um, we definitely saw that there was an association um, men more than women younger people more than older people um, and we could and dose two more common than dose one and so we were these were the data that were reported again at the acip meeting to demonstrate the potential adverse events of these vaccines being my, myocarditis and of course everybody was certainly talking about the fact that myocarditis itself could occur with regard um, after COVID or during COVID as well. And so then of course, we look at these increased rates in dose two, especially among men, and then we could do a very similar risk benefit analysis, again, presented at our ACIP meeting, weighing the risks and benefits. So um, among, we'll look at men here first because those were the highest risk. Among men between the ages of 18 and 24, the highest risk demographic, um, if you prevented 12,000 uh, COVID-19 cases, 530 hospitalizations, 127 ICU admissions, and three deaths, you would get somewhere between 45 to 56 cases of myocarditis, most of these self-limited, most of these mild disease, often related to hospitalizations for observation generally for a very short period of time. Risks were even more favorable for vaccination among young women between the ages of 18 to 24, 14,000 hospitalizations prevented 1,120 uh, sorry, cases prevented, 1,127 hospitalizations prevented, 93 ICU visits and 13 deaths for four to five um, cases of myocarditis. Again, again generally self-limited, generally mild, generally reversible. So it was with these data that we have been able to demonstrate um, really the extraordinary, extraordinary safety of these vaccines, that and the fact that we've vaccinated over, used over nearly 400 million doses to date so far in this country. Um, what One of the new things that was related to our vaccine safety monitoring was vaccine safety in pregnant women. 
And maybe I'll just go back and start telling the story about some of the challenges that we have had um, in communication and, and, and disease for pregnant women, specifically COVID-19 disease. So COVID-19 um, disease in pregnancy is, is, um, is bad. Pregnant women are considered high risk group for this severe complication. And there is actually a living systematic review of cohort studies now um, over 192 studies with results from over 67,000 and pregnant women with COVID-19. Um, compared to non-pregnant women of reproductive age, pre pregnant women are less likely to be asymptomatic. That is, they're more likely to have symptoms and they're more likely by, to be admitted to the ICU by over twofold, more likely to require mechanical ventilation by over twofold, and more likely to require ECMO by over twofold. Um, compared to pregnant Compared with pregnant women without COVID, pregnant women with COVID are also more likely to have a preterm birth or more likely to have a stillbirth. So COVID-19 is bad for young women who are pregnant. Um, it leads to more adverse outcomes among pregnant women. It also leads to more adverse outcomes for the baby. So bad. Um, we see as we follow these data and and there's a two week data lag because we don't always have um, the information about when we get um, the demographics in whether that woman is pregnant so we have a little bit more time that we need to collect those data but essentially the demographics of who's getting disease with COVID-19 um, who's pregnant very much follow the epidemic curves that we saw early on. Um, there have been a total reported of about 125,000 cases of pregnant women um, with COVID-19, over 20,000 hospitalizations of pregnant women with COVID-19. And tragically, in August 2021, there were 21 deaths of pregnant women due to COVID-19 in the United States. And that is the month that will have the dubious um, mark of, of, um, of being the most fatal month for pregnant women that we've had on record um, so far to date. So, then, the, of course, the next question is, why are so many pregnant get, women getting sick um, if this is, a, we know we need to prevent disease? And part of that issue is we haven't been vaccinating them well. So let's go back to that story. Um, the first challenge is that the, vac the vaccine trials did not enroll pregnant women. And that I think was a disservice to them early on. Um, we had tens of thousands of people enrolled in all of the vaccine trials. This is a publication that was published early in March that demonstrated that all of the pregnancies in these vaccine trials were essentially accidental pregnancies. Um, we had a total of, you know, 20 some odd, 20, 28 in the control group, similar number in the vaccinated group, and not enough data at all to say anything about the safety of these vaccines in, pre in pregnancy. So what have we at CDC been doing? Well, it turns out that that V-Safe active um, email or our smartphone app actually collects pregnancy data, which is great. It allows us to then collect the pregnancy data and for people who um, have reported being pregnant, we can then call them and get um, uh, information from them about the timing of their vaccine related to their pregnancy, um, about the timing of their vaccine related to conception, and then we can get permission to follow them over time. That's been extraordinary um, time consuming and a lot of legwork, but that is what has allowed us to follow these pregnant women over time. So if there is somebody who reports that they're pregnant in VSAFE, we follow up with them. We call them several times in each of their trimesters, as well as at their birth and postpartum, as well as at their baby's early infancy within um, three months, just after three months after their baby is born, to get a really good um, comprehensive interview as to what is happening in that pregnancy, what happened with that, the outcomes of that birth. Um, so far, we've uh, followed over 5,000 women um, we have a pretty good distribution, um, actually similar distribution as, as, um, as vaccines throughout the country. About half of them have received Pfizer, about 44% have received Moderna, and about 5% have received J&J. These data have allowed us to look at any safety signals um, in early trimester or late trimesters early on because we had um, more women delivering who had gotten their vaccine late. And then more recently now, um, outcomes for women who've been vaccinated early in pregnancy. Um, 
data, uh, statistical analyses on these are really complicated, um, in, especially as you're looking at frequent events like um, like spontaneous abortion, especially since that varies very much by maternal age. Those complex analyses were done. They've been published in the um, New England Journal. The unadjusted cumulative risk of spontaneous abortion after an mRNA vaccine is about 14%. Um, after it's age standardized, it's about 12.8%. And that is very similar, falls squarely within the confidence intervals to publish baseline estimates of spontaneous abortion. So this was really more evidence that mRNA vaccines um, during pregnancy are not associated with spontaneous abortion, much unlike the disinformation that is out there. And this has been among the challenges that we have had to combat. Um, and I tell you this, completely humbly looking at these data that were just posted in the last couple last week on the CDC website that demonstrates even though we have seen science that says increased rates of disease, increased rates of hospitalization, ICU stays, um, ECMO and mechanical ventilation, a whole 30% of our pregnant women in the United States are now fully vaccinated. Um, we have seen among African Americans about 15% of our pregnant women are vaccinated. Um, and this is someplace where we're putting out a big push for um, medical uh, personnel. We have collaborations and work closely with um, American College of Obstetrics and OBGYN of Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine to really try to get uh, pregnant women vaccinated to avoid these adverse outcomes. Um, Moving on to vaccine effectiveness. Um, this has been a lot of the news and this is really like, how are our vaccines working in the real world? Um, early on, CDC was monitoring um, and we continue to monitor breakthrough infections. What has been in the news a lot, and maybe I can help clarify, is why did CDC stop monitoring um, a, uh, asymptomatic and mild cases of breakthrough? Um, and it's not that we don't care, <laughs> it is that those were not particularly helpful ways for us to monitor disease. We were getting passive reporting um, from states. We were not getting uh, uh, unbiased reporting. We were not getting a comprehensive view um, of, of when people were passively reporting um, from states, we were getting more reports from some states rather than others. And it didn't allow us to get a really good picture of what was going on. It's an important way for us to, um, to get data, but it wasn't the only way that we were gonna be able to report how our vaccines were doing. What was frequently happening is we were, um, getting passive reports, we knew they were an undercount, um, and people were looking that, at them as the count and then commenting on their vaccine effectiveness um, as that being the, the count of, of breakthrough cases, and we, we knew them to be too low. Um, it was also the case that when, when people were reporting breakthrough inf infections passively through their states, we couldn't actually get access to the sample. If we couldn't get access to the sample, we couldn't tell how breakthroughs were working in terms of viral load infect and or in terms terms of um, genomic sequence. So we didn't have a really good sense of what sequences were people bre breaking through with. So this remains one of the tools in our toolbox, but not the best tool that we have to really understand and monitor um, vaccine effectiveness over time. So how do we do that um, epidemiologically? And these are really um, uh, the cohorts, among the cohorts, I should say, that we do use to monitor um, how we are doing with vaccine effectiveness. So the NHSN, the National um, Health Safety Network, is a network of long-term care facility residents. It includes over 15,000 facilities, over 300,000 weekly reports from these facilities. A lot of testing going on in these weekly facilities. Not all of them have universal screening every day or once a week, but many of them do. Um, and they monitor for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Our Heroes Recover cohort, another really helpful cohort of um, people who are vaccinated, they are frontline workers and healthcare workers, eight sites distributed around the country, over 5,000 uh, participants. And the Heroes Recover cohort, interestingly, actually swabs everybody once a week. So this is a really good cohort that we can look at for asymptomatic breakthrough infections. It's one of the few that are um, really looking at, at swabbing everyone every week. Again, looking at infections as well as symptomatic disease. These other three, um, vision, IV, and COVID net cohorts are all either hospitalization or urgent care cohorts, again, distributed about around the country. Just to give you a sense of the size, 
The vision cohort includes all of Kaiser Permanente as well as all of Intermountain Health. Um, massive cohorts of people, 187 hospitals, 227 emergency departments and urgent care facilities. And then IV 21 hospitals in 18 states, COVID net 250 hospitals in 15 states. <clears throat> Excuse me, some of these can look at both pediat pediatric as well as adult. Um, and so we really get a really nice view of what's going on um, around the country, both in hospitalizations, infections, and asymptomatic illness. Um, this, these are data from our COVIDnet cohort. Um, and these were published in the MMWR. Uh, you can see the unvaccinated people shown in blue, vaccinated people shown in green. And these are looks at, looking at the rate per 100,000 in a hospital in a population of hospitalizations. So you can see between the ages of 18 and 49 that there's a 23-fold increased risk of hospitalizations compared to um, unvaccinated people. Between the ages of 50 to 64, you could see a 22-fold increased risk of hospitalization between unvaccinated and vaccinated. And over the age of 65, you can see a 13-fold increased risk. So already in these cohorts, that might say, well, maybe the vaccines are not protecting our older populations as well. Um, and that is an area that we have been looking at carefully. We then look at the vaccine effectiveness over time, and each of these lines represents a different cohort over time. Um, and so we can monitor what is happening between February and March, March to April, and of course, we can look carefully at what happened between June and July. So a lot happened between June and July. First, some of our people are starting to have some time of vaccination behind them, some you know, six months, seven months that they have started between their first or second dose of vaccine and July. And the other thing that happened is um, on June 20th was the date that our country had a majority of known Delta cases. So um, hard to, for some of these, not all of them, to be able to disentangle vaccine waning versus less efficacy of, um, of the vaccines um, against Delta. And there are numerous cohorts now, specifically the Heroes Recover cohort, um, that is looking specifically at whether this is an impact of Delta or an impact of duration since vaccination. We can do the same thing for hospitalizations. I should say that previous slide was for vaccine effectiveness against infection. And this slide now demonstrates our vaccine effectiveness against hospitalizations over time. Again, many of our cohorts reporting out, you see a few that are starting to see some waning over time against hospitalizations, but most relatively stable against hospitalizations. And then we can use these cohorts to report vaccine effectiveness against infection um, for those greater or hospitalization, infection shown in blue, hospitalization shown in red. Um, we can uh, stratify it by demographics, for example, those over the age of 65 in a pre-Delta era versus a Delta era, you start to see some early waning with infection, maybe also some early waning with hospitalization. Underlying medical conditions, again, really hard to tease apart in some of our cohorts working on doing more of this, um, as well as frontline workers. And these are data from our Heroes Recover cohort. But again, also having to take all the methods into account. This Heroes Recover data, as you'll recall, is the one that does um, uh, asymptomatic screening, so may very well be more likely to detect more disease than in some of our other cohorts. Um, of course, uh, now we're looking at uh, boosting um, and because our vaccine uh, effectiveness data have led us to have recommendations related to boosting and we now have the responsibility at CDC to talk about who's been boosted and with what. So we will be looking um, and posting data on um, who has gotten an initial dose by manufacturer? Where did you get your primary dose? Um, was it a Pfizer? Was it a Moderna? Was it a Janssen? And then what is the manufacturer of your additional dose? Um, right now, our guidance is really for generally those who are severely immunocompromised in which we recommend that you get the same thing that you got. And then also for um, people who have received the Pfizer um, vaccine. And then, of course, as, as people have been following the news, everyone, I think, knows that more is to come on boosting for um, Moderna and J&J &J recipients. 
We have been able to um, look at our safety data so far for boosts. Um, and what's really comforting to see is um, you can see dose one, you can see dose two, and you can see now in, in um, gray dose three, um, we're looking at any injection site reaction, any systemic reaction, what the general health impact has been, whether you've been able to perform your daily duties, whether you've been able to work, and whether you've needed to um, receive medical care. And all of these for dose three, um, at least for the mRNA vaccines where you've had dose three, have been really um, very similar to um, dose two, um, which gives us a really nice um, uh, look at where we're going to start seeing um, the safety data come out. Um, so about a week and a half ago, we, uh, up, we provided recommendations recommendations for um, people to receive a booster shot in certain populations. Um, we put recommendations forward for those over the age of 65. Again, this is for only Pfizer, for only those who are greater than six months after their second dose. Um, for people who live in long-term care facilities, we had a strong recommendation for people between the ages of 50 to 64 with underlying medical conditions, and then had recommendations that people be eligible for a boost between the ages of 18 and 49 if they had underlying medical conditions, and between the ages of 18 and 64 if they were high risk based on virtue virtue of where they lived or worked. So this includes healthcare workers, teachers, um, grocery workers, other frontline workers. So uh, hard to imagine talking about COVID without talking about schools. This is um, charged um, and, and uh, has I never expected would be part of my daily existence uh, a year ago, but we spent a lot of time and energy talking about the importance of um, schools and keeping our children safe. So going back a little bit historically, um, in the month of March 2020, all 50 states closed their K-12 schools. Um, school closure at the time was associated um, with a significant decline in COVID-19 incidents and mortality. And um, there was real concern that schools might be one of the places that we really needed to um, close in order to keep the pandemic um, at bay. States that closed schools earlier had a larger relative decrease in COVID-19 incidents and death than states that closed schools later. Um, and the real question was, were children, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of data on transmission in children, on transmission in general, and were schools among the motivating factors that was promoting more, um, more of the surge? This was an early paper that was published in the MMWR out of Mississippi, looking at emergency departments um, among children, emergency department visits among children under the age of 18. And this was just a first really important window as to what was going on. Um, this study demonstrated that children were more likely to present to the emergency department if they had close contact with a COVID-19 case, that makes sense. If they went to social gatherings, if they went to birthday parties, weddings, funerals, if they went and they were outside in the community socializing, if they had childhood gatherings, play dates, and, and again, birthday parties, as well as if they had visitors in the home. So it was the mixing that was really important here. And interestingly, what was protective was whether they had in-person school, um, not statistically significant, but getting close to, um, or if they went to school and they um, had, if they participated in school itself. Um, there were, uh, um, and if this schooling was masked. So this was a, a really important window as to maybe it wasn't actually the school itself, but maybe it was the activities around school that were leading to more transmission. Um, we have updated our guidance for schools, I think three times since I've been um, the director of the CDC. And currently the school guidance is that evidence suggests that the K-12 schools that have strictly implemented prevention strategies have been able to safely reopen um, for in-person instruction. And we have seen many examples of that. Um, our K through 12 operational strategy involves a layered mitigation that includes prevention strategies, universal correct masking for everyone in the school in the current moment. Also includes physical distancing, um, cohorting of kids, um, uh, as well as screening testing um, and contact tracing and improved ventilation. Um, vaccination of students is, of course, um, a, a foundation of what we're doing in schools, both uh, among students over the age of 12 who are eligible right now, as well as teachers and staff. We're really trying to promote and getting the community vaccinated, getting the people in the school vaccinated, especially in schools where the kids are not yet eligible for vaccination. 
Um, and in the spirit of really trying to move quickly in terms of demonstrating the science, there are two MMWRs that were put out about a week and a half ago, um, and really from this school year. So we're really trying to do the science and publish it in real time to inform what's happening right now. This was this school year, August through um, September 17th, demonstrated that 96% of schools have actually remained open for in-person learning, um, and that that is possible to do so safely. We have had over 1800 schools that have had to close because of school related outbreaks and that affects um, incredibly nearly a million students nationwide so really the the message of this first paper is we can keep our schools open safely and when we don't it has massive impact for our students um, on the right was a second mmwr that was published in a series of two of three related to schools this one was in counties in um, arizona there were 191 county uh, school associated outbreaks in the two counties that were examined in arizona 113 of those occurred in schools without mask requirements only 16 of those incurred in schools with early mask requirements. And we were essentially able to demonstrate that you had a three and a half times um, more likely risk of having your school have a school related outbreak if you didn't mask. And this was again, more data to demonstrate that masking in schools is a way to prevent the outbreaks and keep our schools open. I want to close with just a few minutes about um, health equity. I, I feel like in this moment in time, we cannot have, I can't give a talk without really discussing health equity. Um, I, I entered the field of infectious disease um, in watching health equity play out in the HIV um, uh, epidemic here in this country in the mid 90s, um, what I and, and those in the field of infectious diseases and medicine have have known all along has happened in COVID-19 as well. Um, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 reached our land through people who could travel on airplanes and, and take cruises. And it quickly became a disease where we were reporting higher incidents, higher hospitalizations and higher death rates from people um, of, from racial and ethnic minority groups. Um, this slide I find so very sobering. This is um, provisional life expectancy estimates for 2020. Um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, just in the first um, six months of 2020, we had a loss of life expectancy in this country of 1.2 years for white Americans. Um, loss of life expectancy in general shouldn't happen. Um, we knew it would happen for COVID-19. 1.2 years of life expectancy lost is an extraordinarily high number for people who look at these life expectancy estimates. What's really sobering is that as high as that is for white Americans, it's 2.9 years of life lost for Hispanics and three years of life lost. I'm sorry, 2.9 years of life lost for Blacks and three years of life lost for Hispanics. These are extraordinarily high life expectancy losses um, and clearly um, in our racial and ethnic minority communities. And this is what we are working every day to combat. Um, one of the ways that we can look at this is through our social vulnerability index. So a high social vulnerability index is a community-based um, indices of um, whether, where and how people get to work, where they, um, whether they have a car, and, and essentially, and many other different metrics, I think there are 15 of them. High social vulnerability index on this map is shown by these red and darker purple colors. And we can map this to the percent of the population that is fully vaccinated. And you can essentially see in areas that have this, this coral hue, that those are places that have high social vulnerability and low vaccination rates. Um, and they're not going to be surprising. There are areas like Georgia, West Virginia, Missouri, um, Tennessee, Alabama. And these are areas where we have an extraordinary amount of work to do, not just for initial vaccines, but for booster shots and to get support for testing, for getting the support we need to those communities that have just been hardest hit by this pandemic. Um, in April, and we are actually creating this map uh, for adolescents as well, uh, so that we're able to monitor this as we roll out vaccines for um, adolescents as well as for our younger age groups. Um, in April, um, CDC declared racism as a serious public health threat. Um, I have been doing a lot um, within the agency and outside the agency to make sure that we can address this. One of the things that I have um, asked our centers, divisions, and branches to do within CDC um, so that we can be accountable to, um, to progress here is to create outcomes over the next year, tangible outcomes. Don't just tell me that we have an, a race and ethnicity problem. Don't, I don't want to document the problem. I want 
want tangible outcomes where we can implement interventions and see if they worked. So we are doing this across maternal health, across birth defects, across um, chronic diseases, infectious diseases, across the agency. We've seen really creative um, uh, proposals. What, how, are how are our folate levels doing in areas that, um, at, of um, our uh, uh, African, uh, of our, our American natives in terms of what's, how, how's folate supplementation in their diets. Really incredible um, proposals to see what we can do to improve equity across this country for health equity. So maybe I'll just close and say, um, after two years, we continue to learn and adapt to a virus that has proven to be an opportunist. Um, and it's proven to me to be humbling indeed. Um, our cases and our hospitalizations remain high right now. I know this, uh, numbers are coming down, but now is not the time to, um, to let up our guard. Primary vaccination rates remain low in parts of the country and really throughout the world. We didn't talk about the rest of the world, but, but across the world. Um, and while we are necessarily implementing booster shots, we cannot take our eye off the ball that 70 million Americans in this country have still not been primarily vaccinated. And that is really the hard work we have to do. Um, as science evolves, we have to be prepared to adapt our guidance and our recommendations to balance the safety and effectiveness of our interventions, and we watch this carefully. We continue to monitor both safety, safety of our vaccines as well as the effectiveness of the vaccines. And I am committed, as is the rest of this agency, to ensure that science is driving the policy recommendations to keep our children safe and in school. Um, our actions must, at every step of the way, take equity into consideration and focus on those who have been hit, as, hit hardest by infectious diseases historically and specifically by COVID-19 right now. Um, so with that, I will close. Um, I really thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I thank you for what you all are personally doing through this pandemic. I know um, there have been so many out there who have um, rolled up their sleeves in science, in, in clinical science, in translational science, in basic science, um, and in epidemiology and public health to um, make this better. And so I salute all of you who are in this with me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walensky, for this very interesting talk. Um, we have a number of questions coming in from students, and I tried to break it down into questions on the science and policy and questions on your experience as the CDC director. So Edward and Vishnu both asked, what is the CDC doing to address misinformation and disinformation? Um, how do we think the CDC can reach out to people who are reading and spreading misinformation? We're doing a lot, and a lot of this has been related. Um, also, we're doing this not just at the CDC level, and our H but to our HHS colleagues. Um, so the Surgeon General, as you probably know, put out a report about the um, public health um, challenges and public health um, uh, uh, of this and disinformation. We know that mis and disinformation is um, is propagated actually more commonly than, than true information. Um, and so we have done a lot both with our, um, our um, societies, our medical societies. We're doing a lot on the ground um, in, we've done a lot with our pharmacy partners. Um, we are uh, out there with, I, I think we've been out there in, in uh, YouTubes and in, um, uh, influencers and micro micro influencers, which is not something I necessarily thought I would be doing, um, but really trying to get the other messages heard. We've been working collaboratively with some country uh, companies to make sure that um, search engines will bring up the proper information. Um, but this, I think, has been an underestimated um, challenge in this pandemic. Um, and so we we are working hard. We at CDC have what we call vaccine confidence consults. So so um, any jurisdiction can call us and say, or a faith-based organization or a community-based organization, um, we work closely with them, but they can call us and say, I have these kinds of questions that are coming to me about, about mis and disinformation. Can you um, help me, provide me a slide deck, provide me a toolkit on how I combat this information so I can spread it within our community? So we have a lot of activities that are ongoing um, and we still have a lot more work to do. So that question leads us really well into another question. A student asked, I have many family members that still aren't vaccinated for reasons that are disproven. 
such as fears of impotency and government microchips. I was wondering if you've had any family members in your own life and who you've had to convince to be vaccinated. How did you and the CDC create broad public health measures to convince people to get vaccinated? Um, so, so yes, I have. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think of this as um, stages of change, essentially. I, I think if we all come into this as I'm going to have this conversation with said person and um, and I will convince them to get vaccinated, that we may be setting ourselves up for failure. That would be a win for sure, but we would be setting ourselves up for failure. So I think we have to have these conversations sort of over time um, and say, especially for those who really um, may or may not understand the science or understand where they are and, and really sort of chisel away with, let's agree on what we agree on. Like, let's agree, we don't, we want you to be safe. We want you to be out of the hospital. What's the best way that we can um, achieve that? What are your concerns? And I think everybody's concerns are different. Um, what's the science that you need to see? And I always say that my job isn't necessarily to convince people to get vaccinated, but to show them the data that they would need to see published in reputable places um, so that they would agree that they should get vaccinated for their own health. Um, I also recognize that I am perhaps not um, the best messenger for some people. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I think I have personally felt in, in coming to this position is um, I spent 20 years entering patient rooms. And um, in doing so, no one ever really questioned my intent. My intent was always to take care of the patient and that patient knew that I was there to take care of them. And, and so that has been a challenge for me that I may not be the best messenger for some people. Um, and so the real question is who is the best messenger for those people? And um, let's make sure that they're empowered with the information that they need. Another student asked, do you anticipate new formulations of the vaccines being created for current or future variants? And how important is it to develop a pan-coronavirus vaccine? Um, so there are probably vaccinologists on this call that may be better equipped to answer this than I. But what I will say is, it is uh, the companies are looking at whether we should have variant-specific vaccines versus um, versus sort of the wild-type vaccines that we have right now. Um, it is possible to do, and the question is, should we be doing it? Um, we have yet to see data, immunologic data, that have demonstrated that when we have a variant-specific vaccine, that it gives us the breadth and depth of the um, coverage that we get from the wild-type vaccine. So right now, all of our strategies have been to continuing to use the wild type vaccine. That's actually good news logistically. I think if we had to do it, we would do it for, for the next, you know, for the next variant. Um, it would be a complex logistical challenge. And when I, I say that um, humbly, as we think about what it will take to roll out pediatric vaccines, um, what it will take to roll out boosters that may be in other, in. Um, in different doses. So um, as we think about that, if we had sort of um, Pfizer boosters at standard dose, Moderna boosters, Moderna boosters that may have to be at half dose, we'll see what FDA says, um, pediatric doses of Pfizer that are at a different dose and a different formulation, infant doses that may in fact be the different dose and formulation and then layer on top of that variant specific that's a logistical challenge it's doable but it's a logistical challenge so um of course we will do it if the science dictates that we need to but right now we have been fortunate to not have to do so so we have a lot of questions on the science that maybe we won't have time to get to but i do want to uh field the questions related to your role as a cdc director um so lila would like to know what is it like being a woman scientist in such a public position of power? Do you have any tips for young women scientists? Um, so I had a very wise mentor say to me um, long ago that if you weren't just a little bit scared for your next job, that it wasn't big enough. Um, so I said, this job's probably big enough. <laughs> um, you know, I was very nervous coming in. There's no question about that. Um, it has been humbling to be here. Um, I, uh, you know, there are rooms that I'm in most definitely where I am in a minority. I will say um, one of the other things that has been where I've been in a minority is um, because of so many of the policy issues, 
I am also frequently in the minority in that I'm the only one with an MD or a master's degree, and there's a lot of lawyers in the room or counsel. So um, that has been, you know, it, I have been, um, it, it's not a surprise, I knew that would be the case, but it has been more common, I think, that I feel like I'm more in a minority where I was like, God, I really just wish I knew, knew and understood the law about this a little bit more than I have in the minority about, about gender. So as our last question, Koki would like to know, as CDC director, what do you feel is the most challenging thing in establishing scientific communication between scientists and the public? How do you see yourself as a liaison between scientists and the general population of the US in terms of communi communicating public health? Yeah, this has been um, a really steep learning curve for me. Um, and part of the challenge I have felt is, I, you know, it is, it is my job to take complex science and turn it into something that is not just easily understood by the public, but easily understood in a two minute soundbite. <laughs> um, and so you really don't wanna breeze over the details for people who no one would understand. Um, so you have to kind of walk that balance. The other thing that has been really hard is um, uh, the, the, um, the, the speed at which science is changing. And um, that, you know, in a current pandemic time, that has just been, you know, why today? Why not? Why, why is it different tomorrow? Why is it different with Delta? Why are we masking now? Um, and so it, it really has, you know, somebody has said to me, you know, Today, we took out our umbrellas because we looked at the weather and it was raining. Tomorrow, we won't. Um, that's okay for the weather, but it's not okay for science. And so that's been um, among the things that has been hardest for me um, to just try and keep. It, it's not the keeping up the, with the science. It's communicating the science to others and making sure we do so in a way where um, people have been, you know, feel informed about what we're doing. I will say it, um, the media hasn't always helped in this regard. Um, one of the things that has been interesting for me is um, watching the VRPAC meetings and the FDA scientific meetings and the um, CDC scientific meetings that are public and they're public and transparent. And I think that that's great. We want to keep them that way. What that means is we've had over 40,000 people tune into some of our meetings um, in a way that nobody tuned into them before, just in terms of the audience. Um, there's really important scientific dialogue, some people dissenting, some people showing their, you know, demonstrating their point of views. That never before was put on the nightly news. Um, so when you have that dissension actually put on in the nightly news, that is this really healthy scientific dialogue. It's not great for consumer understanding because it does feed that there's controversy. And um, so that has been hard as well. Okay, unfortunately we're out of time, but on behalf of myself and Dr. Young and Dr. Batista, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and good luck to you all.